Welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will continue our readings from The View from the Stars by Walter M. Miller Jr. And tonight we're continuing Dumbwaiter. A few blocks away, he found another house with an intact roof and prepared to spend the night. He wheeled the bicycle into the parlor and fumbled for the lights. They came on, revealing a dusty room and furniture with frayed upholstery. He made a brief tour of the house. It had been recently occupied, but there were still unopened cans in the kitchen and still crumpled sheets on the bed. He ate a cold supper, shaved, and prepared to retire. Tomorrow would be a dangerous day. Sleep came slowly. Sleep was full of charging ramjets in flax-scarred skies, full of tormented masses of people that swarmed in exodus from death-sickened cities. Sleep was full of babies wailing and women crying and choking sobs. Sleep became white arms and soft caresses. The wailing and sobbing had stopped. It was later. Was he awake or still asleep? He was warm, basking in a golden glow, steeped in quiet pleasure. Something, something was there. Something that breathed. What? Shh, heard a quiet voice. Don't say anything. Some of the warmth fled before a sudden shiver. He opened his eyes. The room was full of blackness. He shook his head dizzily and stuttered. Shh, she whispered again. What is this? He gasped. How did you get? Be quiet, George. You'll wake the baby. He sank back in utter bewilderment with winter frost gathering along his spine. Night was dreamlike, and dawn came, washing the shadows with grayness. He opened his eyes briefly and went back to sleep. When he opened them again, sunlight was flooding the room. He sat up. He was alone. Of course, it had only been a dream. He muttered irritably as he dressed, then he wandered into the kitchen for breakfast. Warm biscuits waiting in the oven. The table was set. There was a note on his plate. He read it and slowly flushed. There's jam in the cupboard and I hope you like the biscuits. I know he's dead. Now I think I can go on alone. Thanks for the shotgun and the bicycle. Marta. He bellowed a curse and charged into the parlor. The bike was gone. He darted to the bedroom. The shotgun was gone. He ran shouting to the porch, but the street was empty. Sparrows fluttered about the eaves. The skyline of the business district lay lonesome in the morning sun. Squirrels were rustling in the branches of the trees. He looked at the weedy lawns where no children played, at the doors askew on their hinges, at a bit of aircraft wreckage jutting from the roof of a fire gutted home, the rotting porches, the emptiness. He rubbed his cheek ruefully. It was no world for a young mother and her baby. The baby would fit nicely in the bicycle's basket. The shotgun would offer some protection against the human wolf packs that prowled everywhere these days. Little thief, he growled half-heartedly. But when the human animal would no longer steal to protect its offspring, then its prospects for survival would be bleak indeed. He shrugged gloomily and wandered back to the kitchen. He sat down and ate the expensive biscuits and decided that George couldn't have cut his throat for culinary reasons. Marta was a good cook. He entered the city on foot and unarmed later in the morning. He chose the alleyways, avoiding the thoroughfares where traffic purred and where the robot cops enforced the letter of the law. At each corner, he paused to glance in both directions against possible mechanical observers before darting across the open street to the next alley. 
The Geigers on the lampposts were clicking faster as he progressed deeper into the city, and twice he paused to inspect the readings of their integrating dials. The radioactivity was not yet dangerous, but it was higher than he had anticipated. Perhaps it had been dusted again after the exodus. He stopped to prowl through an empty house and an empty garage. He came out with a flashlight, a box of tools, and a crowbar. He had no certain plan, but tools would be needed if he meant to call a temporary halt to Central's activities. It was dangerous to enter any building, however. Central would call it burglary unless the prowler could show legitimate reason for entering. He needed some kind of identification. After an hour's search through several houses in the residential district, he found a billfold containing a union card and a pass to several restricted buildings in the downtown area. The billfold belonged to a Willie Jesser, an air conditioning and refrigeration mechanic for the Howard Cooler Company. He pocketed it after a moment's hesitation. It might not be enough to satisfy Central, but for the time being, it would have to do. By early afternoon, he had reached the beginning of the commercial area. Still, he had seen no signs of human life. The thinly scattered traffic moved smoothly along the streets, carrying no passengers. Once he saw a group of robot climbers working high on a telephone pole. Some of the telephone cables carried the coordinating circuits for the city's network of computers. He detoured several blocks to avoid them and wandered glumly on. He began to realize that he was wandering aimlessly. The siren came suddenly from half a block away. Mitch stopped in the center of the street and glanced fearfully toward it. A robot cop was rolling toward him at 20 miles an hour. You will halt, please, croaked the cop's mechanical voice. The pedestrian with the toolbox will please halt. Mitch stopped at the curb. Flight was impossible. The skater could whisk along at 40 miles per hour if he chose. The cop's steel wheels screeched to a stop a yard away. The head nodded a polite but jerky greeting. Mitch stared at the creature's eyes, even though he knew the eyes were duds. The cop was seeing him by the heat waves from his bodily warmth and touching him with a delicate aura of radar. You are charged with jaywalking, sir. I must present you with a summons. Your identification, please. Mitch nervously produced the billfold and extracted the cards. The cop accepted them in a pair of tweezer-like fingers and instantly memorized the information. This is insufficient identification. Have you nothing else? That's all I have with me. What's wrong with it? The pass and the union card expired in 1987. Mitch swallowed hard and said nothing. He had been afraid of this. Now he might be picked up for vagrancy. I shall consult Central Coordinator for instructions, croaked the cop. One moment, please. A dynamotor purred softly in the policeman's cylindrical body. Then Mitch heard the faint twittering of computer code as the cop's radio spoke to Central. There was a silence lasting several seconds, then an answering twitter back. Still the cop said nothing, but he extracted a summons form from a pad, inserted it in a slot in his chassis, and made chomping sounds like a small typesetter. When he pulled the ticket out again, it was neatly printed with a summons for Willie Jesser to appear before traffic court on July 29, 1989. The charge was jaywalking. Mitch accepted it with bewilderment. I believe I have a right to ask for an explanation, he muttered. The cop nodded crisply. Central service units are required to furnish explanations of decisions when such explanations are demanded. Then why did Central regard my identification as insufficient? Pause for translation of Central's message, said the cop. He stood for a moment making burring and clicking sounds. Then, referring to the arrest of Willie Jesser by Unit 6 Baker, do not book for investigation. Previous investigations have revealed no identification papers dated later than May 1987 in the possession of any human pedestrian. Data based on 100 sample cases. Tentative generalization by Central Service. It has become impossible for humans to produce satisfactory identification. Therefore, satisfactory identification is temporarily redefined 
pending instruction from authorized human legislative agency. Mitch nodded thoughtfully. The decision indicated that Central was still capable of learning, of gathering data and making generalizations about it. But the difficulty was still apparent. She was allowed to act on such generalizations only in certain very minor matters. Although she might very well realize the situation in the city, she could do nothing about it without authority from an authorized agency. That agency was a department of the city government, currently non-existent. The cop croaked a courteous, good day, sir, and skated smoothly back to his intersection. Mitch stared at his summons for a moment. The date was still four days away. If he weren't out of the city by then, he might find himself in the lockup since he had no money to pay a fine. Reassured now that his borrowed identity gave him a certain amount of safety, he began walking along the sidewalks instead of using the alleys. Still, he knew that Central was observing him through a thousand eyes. Counters on every corner were set to record the passage of pedestrian traffic and to relay the information to Central, thus helping to avoid congestion. But Mitch was the pedestrian traffic, and the counters clocked his passage. Since the data was, un was available to the logic units, Central might make some unpleasant deductions about his presence in the city. Brazenness, he decided, was probably the safest course to steer. He stopped at the next intersection and called to another mechanical cop, requesting directions to City Hall. But the cop paused before answering, paused to speak with Central, and Mitch suddenly regretted his question. The cop came skating slowly to the curb. Six blocks west and four blocks north, sir, croaked the cop. Central requests the following information, which you may refuse to furnish if you so desire. As a resident of the city, how is it you do not know the way to City Hall, Mr. Jesser? Mitch whitened and stuttered nervously. Why, I've been gone three years. I, I had forgotten. The cop relayed the information, then nodded. Central thanks you. Data has been recorded. Wait, Mitch muttered. Is there a direct contact with Central in City Hall? Affirmative. I want to speak to Central. May I use it? The computer code twittered briefly. Negative. You are not listed among the city's authorized computer personnel. Central suggests you use the public information unit also in City Hall, ground floor rotunda. Grumbling to himself, Mitch wandered away. The public information unit was better than nothing, but if he had access to the direct service contact, perhaps to some extent, he could have altered Central's rigid behavior patterns. The public service unit, however, would be well guarded. A few minutes later, he was standing in the center of the main lobby of the city hall. The great building had suffered some damage during an air raid, and one wing was charred by fire. But the rest of it was still alive with the rattle of machinery. A headless servo secretary came rolling past him carrying a tray full of pink envelopes. Delinquent utility bills, he guessed. Central would keep sending them out, but of course human authority would be needed to suspend service to the delinquent customers. The servo secretary deposited the envelopes in a mailbox by the door, then rolled quickly back to its office. Mitch looked around the gloomy rotunda. There was a desk at the far wall. Recessed in a panel behind the desk were a microphone, a loudspeaker, and the lens of a television camera. A sign hung over the desk indicating that here was the place to complain about utility bills, garbage disposal service, taxes, and inaccurate weather forecasts. A citizen could also request any information contained in central data except information relating to defense or to police records. Mitch crossed the rotunda and sat at the desk facing the panel. A light came on overhead. The speaker crackled for a moment. Your name, please, it asked. Willie Jesser. What do you wish from central information, please? A direct contact with central data. You have a screened contact with central data. Unauthorized personnel are not permitted at unrestricted contact for security reasons. Your contact must be monitored by this unit. Mitch shrugged. It was as he expected. Central data was listening and speaking, but the automatics of the public information unit would be censoring the exchange. All right, he grumbled. 
Tell me this, is Central aware that the city has been abandoned, that its population is gone? Screening, 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 said the unit. Question relates to civil defense. Is Central aware that her services are now interfering with human interests? There was a brief pause. Is this question in the nature of a complaint? Yes, he grated acidly. It's a complaint. About your utility services, Mr. Jesser? Mitch spat an angry curse. About all services, he bellowed. Central has got to suspend all operations until new ordinances are fed into data. That will be impossible, sir. Why? There is no authorization from the Department of City Services. He slapped the desk and groaned. There is no such department now. There is no city government. The city is abandoned. The speaker was silent. Well, he snapped. Screening, said the machine. Listen, he hissed. Are you screening what I say, or are you just blocking the central's reply? There was a pause. Your statements are being recorded in central data. Replies to certain questions must be blocked for security reasons. The war is over, screening. You are trying to maintain a civil status quo that went out of existence three years ago. Can't you use your logic units to correct for present conditions? The degree of self-adjustment permitted to central service is limited by ordinance number, never mind. Is there anything else? Yes. What will you do when 50 men come marching in to dynamite the vaults and destroy central data? Destroying city property is punishable by a fine of Mitch Kirst softly and listen to the voice reading the applicable ordinance. Well, they're planning to do it anyway, he snapped. Conspiracy to destroy city property is punishable by... Mitch stood up and walked away in disgust. But he had taken perhaps ten steps when a pair of robot guards came skating out from their wall niches to intercept him. One moment, sir, they croaked in unison. Well, Central wishes to question you in connection with the alleged conspiracy to destroy city property. You are free to refuse. However, if you refuse, and if such conspiracy is shown to exist, you may be charged with complicity. Will you accompany us to interrogation? A step closer to jail, he thought gloomily. But what was there to lose? He grunted assent and accompanied the skaters out the entrance down an inclined ramp and past a group of heavily barred windows. They entered the police court where a booking computer clicked behind its desk. Several servo secretaries and robot cops were waiting quietly for task assignments. Mitch stopped suddenly. His escorts waited politely. Will you come with us, please? He stood staring around the big room at the various doorways, one leading to traffic court and at the iron gate to the cell block. I hear a woman crying, he muttered. The guards offered no comment. Is someone locked in a cell? We are not permitted to answer. Suppose I want to go bail, he snapped. I have a right to know. You may ask the booking desk whether a specific individual is being held, but generalized information cannot be released. Mitch strode to the booking computer. Are you holding a woman in jail? Screening? It was only a vague suspicion, but he said, a woman named Marta? Full name, please. I don't know it. Can't you tell me? Screening. Listen, I loaned my bicycle to a woman named Marta. If you have the bicycle, I want it. License number, please. A 1987 license, number 6 Zebra 50. Check with lost and found, please. Which controlled himself slowly. Look, you check. I'll wait. The computer paused. A bicycle with that license number has been impounded. Can you produce proof of ownership? On a bicycle? I knew the number. Isn't that enough? Describe it, please. Mitch described it wearily. He began to understand Ferris's desire to retire Central permanently and forcibly. At the moment, he longed to convert several subcomputers to scrap metal. Then, said the speaker, if vehicle is yours, you may have it by applying for a new license and paying the required fee. Refer that to central data, Mitch groaned. The booking computer paused to confer with the coordinator. Decision stands, sir. But there aren't any new licenses, he growled. A while ago, Central said... 
Oh, never mind. That decision applied to identification, sir. This applies to licensing of vehicles. Insufficient data has been gathered to permit generalization. Sure, sure, all right. What do I do to get the girl out of jail? There was another conference with the coordinator, then. She is being held for investigation. She may not be released for 72 hours. Mitch dropped the toolbox that he had been carrying since that morning. With a savage curse, he rammed the crowbar through a vent in the device's front panel and slashed it about in the opening. There was a crash of shattering glass and a shower of sparks. Mitch yelped at the electric jolt and lurched away. Steel fingers clutched his wrists. Five minutes later, he was being led through the gate to the cell blocks charged with maliciously destroying city property, and he cursed himself for a hot-tempered fool. They would hold him until a grand jury convened, which would probably be forever. The girl's sobbing grew louder as he was led along the iron corridor toward the cell. He passed three cells and glanced inside. The cells were occupied by dead men's bones. Why? The rear wall was badly cracked and bits of loose masonry were scattered on the floor. Had they died of concussion during an attack or been gassed to death? They led him to the fifth cell and unlocked the door. Mitch stared inside and grinned. The rear wall had been partially wrecked by a bomb blast and there was room to crawl through the opening to the street. The partition that separated the adjoining cell was also damaged, and he caught a glimpse of a white, frightened face peering through the hole. Marta. He glanced at his captors. They were pushing him gently through the door. Evidently, Central's talents did not extend to bricklaying, and she could not judge that the cell was less than escape-proof. The door clanked shut behind him. Marta, he called. Her face had disappeared from the opening. There was no answer. Marta! Let me alone, grumbled a muffled voice. I'm not angry about the bicycle. He walked to the hole and peered through the partition into the next cell. She crouched in a corner, peering at him with frightened, tear-reddened eyes. He glanced at the opening in the rear wall. Why haven't you gone outside, he asked. She giggled hysterically. Why don't you go look down? He stepped to the opening and glanced 20 feet down to a concrete sidewalk. He went back to stare at the girl. Where's your baby? They took him away, she whimpered. Mitch frowned and thought about it for a moment. To the city nursery, probably, while you're in jail. They won't take care of him. They'll let him die. Don't scream like that. He'll be all right. Robots don't give milk. No, but there are such things as bottles, you know, he chuckled. Are there? Her eyes were wide with horror. And what will they put in the bottles? Why, he paused. Central certainly wasn't running any dairy farms. Wait till they bring you a meal, she said. You'll see. Meal? Empty tray, she hissed. Empty tray, empty paper cup, paper fork, clean paper napkin, no food. Mitch swallowed hard. Central's logic was sometimes hard to see. The servo attendants probably went through the motions of ladling stew from an empty pot and drawing coffee from an empty urn. Of course, there weren't any truck farmers to keep the city supplied with produce. So that's why the bones in the other cells, he muttered. They'll starve us to death. Don't scream so. We'll get out. All we need is something to climb down on. There isn't any bedding. There's our clothing. We can plate a rope, and if necessary, we can risk a jump. She shook her head dully and stared at her hands. It's no use. They'll catch us again. Mitch sat down to think. There was bound to be a police arsenal somewhere in the building, probably in the basement. The robot cops were always unarmed, but of course there had been a human organization for investigation purposes and to assume command in the event of violence. When one of the traffic units faced a threat, it could do nothing but try to handcuff the offender and call for human help. There were arms in the building somewhere, and a well-placed rifle shot could penetrate the thin sheet metal bodies. He deplored the thought of destroying any of the city's service machinery, but if it became necessary to wreck a few subunits, it would have to be done. 
he must somehow get access to the vaults where the central data tanks and the coordinators were located, get to them before Ferris's gang came to wreck them completely so that they might be free to pick the city clean. An hour later, he heard the cell block gate groan open and he arose quickly. Interrogation, he thought. They were coming to question him about the plot to wreck Central. He paused to make a hasty decision, then scrambled for the narrow opening and clambered through it into the adjoining cell while the skater came rolling down the corridor. The girl's eyes widened. Oh, what are you? Shh, he hissed. This might work. The skater halted before his cell while he crouched against the wall beyond the opening. Willie, Jesser, please, the robot croaked. There was a silence. He heard the door swing open. The robot rolled around inside his cell for a few seconds, repeating his name and brushing rubble aside to make way. If only it failed to look through the opening. Suddenly a siren growled and the robot went tearing down the corridor again. Mitch stole a quick glance. The robot had left the door ajar. He dragged the girl to her feet and snapped, let's go. They squeezed through the hole and raced out into the corridor. The cell block gate was closed. The girl moaned weakly. There was no place to hide. The door bolts were operated from remote boxes placed in the corridor so as to be beyond the reach of inmates. Mitch dragged the girl quickly toward another cell, opened the control panel, and threw the bolt. He closed the panel, leaving the bolt open. They slipped quickly inside the new cell, and he pulled the door quietly closed. The girl made a choking sound as she stumbled over the remains of the former inmate. Lie down in the corner, he hissed, and keep still. They're coming back in force. What if they notice the bolt is open? Then we're sunk, but they'll be busy down at our end of the hall. Now shut up. They rolled under the steel cot and lay scarcely breathing. The robot was returning with others. The faint twitter of computer code echoed through the cell blocks. Then the skaters rushed past and screeched to a stop before the escapee's cell. He heard them enter. He crawled to the door for a look, then pushed it open and stole outside. He beckoned the girl to his side and whispered briefly. Then they darted down the corridor on tiptoe toward the investigators. They turned as he raced it to view. He seized the bars and jerked the doors shut. The bolt snapped in place as Marta tugged at the remote. Three metal bodies crashed simultaneously against the door and rebounded. One of them spun around three times before recovering. Release the lock, please. Mitch grinned through the bars. Why don't you try the hole in the wall? The robot who had spun crazily away from the door now turned. He went charging across the cell floor at full acceleration and sailed wildly out into space. An ear-splitting crash came from the street. Shattered metal skidded across pavement. The siren wailed and brakes shrieked. The others went to look and began twittering. Then they turned. You will surrender, please. We have summoned armed guards to seize you if you resist. Mitch laughed and tugged at the whimpering girl. Where? To the gate. Come on. They raced swiftly along the corridor, and the gate was opening to admit the armed guards. But of course, no human blue coats charged through. The girl muttered frightened bewilderment, and he explained on the run. Enforced habit pattern. Central has to do it even when no guards are available. Two repair units were at work on the damaged booking computer as the escapees raced past. Their, the repair units paused, twittered a notation to Central, then continued with their work. Minutes later, they found the arsenal and the mechanical attendant had set out a pair of 45s for the armed guards. Mitch caught up one of them and fired at the attendant's sheet metal belly. The robot careened crazily against the wall, emitted a shower of blue sparks, and stood humming while the metal around the hole grew cherry red. There was a dull cough. The machinery smoked and went silent. Mitch vaulted across the counter and caught a pair of submachine guns from the rack, but the girl backed away, shaking her head. I couldn't even use your shotgun, she panted. He shrugged and laid it aside. Carry as much ammunition as you can, then, he barked. Alarm bells were clanging continuously as they raced out of the arsenal, and a loudspeaker was thundering a request for all human personnel to be alert and assist in their capture. Marta was staggering against him as they burst out of the building into the street. 
he pushed her back against the wall and fired a burst at two skaters who raced toward them down the sidewalk. One crashed into a fire plug. The other went over the curb and fell on the street. To the parking lot, he called over his shoulder. But the girl had slumped in a heap on the sidewalk. He grumbled a curse and hurried to her side. She was semi-conscious, but her face was white and drawn. She shivered uncontrollably. What's wrong? he snapped. There was no answer. Fright had dazed her. Her lips moved, seemed to frame a soundless word. George. Muttering angrily, Mitch stuffed a fifty-round drum of ammunition in his belt, took another between his teeth, and lifted the girl over one shoulder. He turned in time to fire a one-hand burst at another skater. The burst went wide, but the skater stopped. Then the skater ran away. He gasped and stared after it. The blare of sound speakers was furnishing the answer. All human personnel, Central Patrol Service has reached the limit of permissible subunit expenditure. Responsibility for capture no longer applied without further orders to expend subunits. Please instruct, Commissioner of Police, please instruct. Waiting, waiting, Mitch grinned. Carrying the girl, he stumbled, stumbled toward a car on the parking lot. He dumped her in the back seat and started in behind her, but a loudspeaker in the front protested. Unauthorized personnel, this is Mayor Sarquist's car. Unauthorized personnel, please use an extra. Mitch looked around. There were no extras on the lot. And if there had been one, it would refuse to carry him unless he could identify himself as authorized to use it. So... Mitch is bouncing from one robot to another, shooting half of them, and we will see how he manages next time.